the, the talks sort of aim towards some of the hiccups that can occur along the way in some productions and, and the sorts of things that can go wrong. I mean, it, I'm not going to be able to cover all of them in the 20 minutes or the 25 minutes that I've got, but a couple of the ones that we've found that may um, trigger some imagina imaginative ways to get around them. Um, we call these things trolls, um, so my talk's about trolls in 3D. So firstly, I probably should introduce who I am. I don't have too many visuals to show you, but uh, I've got a, a, a couple of links I, I can share later on. I've got to really explain where I'm from so it makes sense and why I'm speaking to you about trolls. Um, I've been working in 3D for about 12 years. Uh, we started working with my wife uh, doing design and animation. Uh, I started as a character animator working in real time on a real time engine and my wife was an illustrator when I met her and so we started working together to create illustrations and port portfolios of uh, just 3D models rendered out without any animation. Um, I've been using Blender to do that since 2007, so only for really for five years. We started using it when I met a fellow called Matt Ebb, who's quite well known to the Blender Institute. He came to work with us in around 2006. And um, just for me, it was a real eye-opener to see the kind of software ability that uh, a single person can produce artwork using a free, an open source set of software. So it was very interesting to set up the studio a little bit further along those lines. So in 07, we worked on a project called Jellybots in Blender. Uh, then a, a major project landed for us called Lighthouse in 2008. That was a short film we made over the course of about 12 weeks. Um, no one had touched Blender except Matt. So we, we had about six or seven months of uh, pre-production to learn the tool set, and then we just started the project. So a lot of the... Um, a lot of the artists had never used Blender in production. A lot of the artists had never even opened the interface. So it was a very interesting experience for us to build up a team of six guys into, uh, capable enough to use the software in such a short amount of time. We've also done uh, Kajimba. You might have seen that, perhaps. Um, Kajimba is a short film we've been working on. In fact, it's uh, growing in scope, and now there's a feature film in direction. It's an adult animated um, not, probably not suitable for showing in front of an audience, but it's an adult language animated um, comedy, I suppose. Uh, there's another character we've been building for the last 12 years, which is called the Bridgestone Gecko. Um, it's been done in Blender since 2007, and in fact, I think he looks a lot better now than he did in the earlier days. Bridgestone have got a, a chain of stores all around Australia called Bridgestone Select, and the Bridgestone Gecko has become his their mascot and they keep demanding more and so we're doing probably 12, 12 posters of the Gecko every year and probably a, 120 seconds of animation just for commercial use in retail campaigns around, around Australia. Oh, and we've got another big project that's purely 100% Blender Pipeline. Um, the, there's a cereal company in America called Enviro Kids, um, and they've commissioned a whole uh, set of cereal box illustrations. So we've got, that's going to be released. It's not on store on the shelves yet, but uh, that'll be released probably in the next four months. And so there'll be a lot of Blender artwork out there on shelves selling all your kids sugary-free organic um, cereal. <coughs> Okay, so what do we do? We, we, I, I create commercial art and sell it. I, I make money out of selling commercial art. And really that's why um, I'm into it because I think uh, if you're going to build a career around a hobby, it will be a hobby um, and then you have to go away in your day job and earn your money. But if you can actually make money out of that hobby and <laughs> sell your work that you're doing each day, it makes a lot of sense because you get to do what you love doing and on your own schedules, uh, well, except when you get a client troll and they come along and try to spoil the schedule or the budget. We'll talk about a bit more about that later. We run um, <clears throat> three separate folios at the studio. Um, the, the reason for splitting the branding like that at all is because there are a lot of different um, trolls out there in the industry which don't understand why do you have an animated bridge visualization in the same portfolio as a dancing little puppy. So, you have to split your portfolios into your brandings. Um, we brand under Red Cartel, which is the global brand, I suppose. It's only a, really a team of six people. But the Red Cartel services the gaming industry, so um, graphics you'll see in the gambling and casino environments. Uh, we've got another brand called the Visualization Company, which where um, we sell our visualization for education and, and um, DVDs on how to install, those sorts of things. 
and the Character Mill, which is a, a brand which we use to sell our characters and mascots, um, and also our IP if we've got if we've got some time to work on our intellectual properties. I manage these artworks. I also sometimes get involved in the production of, um, and I'd say probably about 25% of my week I I am in 3D, and thankfully I'm increasing my time in Blender because I'm I'm finding the tool sets very very capable and. Even some of the discussions I've had earlier this morning, some of those tools that are emerging are going to be very, very useful and very, very quick for me to get up some character animation tests or some uh, draft work, which is all part of the commercial pipeline. So there's a short listing of all the softwares that we use in the studio. Um, not all of it's Blend, obviously, but I'm working with artists from all over all over the world. But in studio, we use Blender and Max. And then it doesn't really matter what commercial art software people use if they work remotely as long as they get the task done. And I'm finding more and more people are coming with Blender skills that are very handy to work with. And why am I here? I just want to meet people who use Blender, who are interested in working in Blender, working remotely, working on site in Sydney. And to just learn some more ideas about technique, how to make art work faster. Because if you can make art work faster, you can end up making money faster. And I think that's the point. Well, to me, to me. All right, trolls, what are they? It's really anything that can negatively affect your art flow. If you're creating artwork and there's something comes along that stops you from doing that, you're going to lose money. And so a troll is something that takes away your time and then therefore your income. Um, something that just stops you from doing something in the peak possible efficiency. And I'm categorizing them down into two things. There's people, trolls, and then there's things. Get into that a little bit sooner. <laughs> Think about trolls as people. People that are trolls, they don't tend to know that they are. So it's very, very difficult to try and identify and stop those people from negatively affecting your artwork. You've got trolls inside your own team and trolls that come to you as clients. So the people in your team, they're the whingers, they're the overworkers, there's the negative attitude, there's the drifters, the people that don't really follow the art direction. The people that whinge, well, why don't they just shut up and do it? You know, it's one of those scenarios where you have to make sure that this artwork gets out on time because the client's demanding it, and if you don't get it to him on time, no one gets paid. So it really needs to be addressed. Overworkers, those guys that hit the artwork and go straight to final before anyone's seen it. Yes, it's a remarkable effort on some parts, but if you're going to the point where you're going to have final art without anyone having seen it, it could be completely wrong. You've got to follow the art direction. You have to make sure that you, you're getting your stages approved appropriately whilst you're delivering this artwork. Then there's the whole artists versus the artist's apprentice. Now, this is a very contentious issue when working in a studio because as artists, we all have an artistic interpretation of what needs to happen on this image or this animation. But if you're working in a studio, you're working for that artist or whoever the lead artist on your project is. And if they're providing you with graphic and visual feedback and verbal feedback, you have to follow that feedback because that's the artist. When you can bring your own clients to a studio and your project's on the table and the client that you're talking to is believing your artistic ability, then you can hire apprentices and tell them what to do. But until you get to that point, just follow what the artist has to say. You don't want to troll the artist by throwing in some creative suggestions without asking them because the artwork won't be from that artist and he's not going to, or she's not going to want that. So just the artist versus the artist's apprentice is a big pill to swallow and it's one of those, one of those issues which we run into a lot working with artists all around the world because everybody wants to be the artist. And if you're working for a studio, you have to relinquish that ability and become an apprentice. Now it's, we've got people that have to step into apprentice roles and they've got 10, 15 years experience. But they're happy to because they understand a commercial art pipeline and they have to make sure that the art coming off that pipeline is through that artist. So we run at any point in time 12 people, usually three lead artists. So those those three artists are using those apprentices and or, or not, Apprentice is, is probably a poor word, but the, the artists that help the lead artists achieve their goals. Tactics. Well, 
as a studio, you've got to really determine whether or not you want people on site or at, in remote. Um, there's a lot of tasks out there in 3D that suit remote work, um, modelling, rigging, even some animation. Compositing and rendering perhaps not, but there are an awful lot of tasks that can get off, done off site. But you have to toss up between what trials you want to address. Do you want to address those remote artist trials that just won't return your phone call or return an email or they won't ever pick up the instant message and on the final time they've delivered mediocre artwork that doesn't follow the brief, you don't need those trolls. You have to determine whether you want the control over your own artwork. That means get the trolls into your studio and bash them in there. Scheduling, everyone loves a schedule. If you can explain to an artist how long they'll be on a job, they can in their head determine how fast they need to work. You'll only get to know their workflow after a little while and you'll be able to identify the trolls because they really try hard at the start and then they ease off once the, the urgency becomes apparent, the less apparent. So every art project <laughs> needs a consistent art flow. You can't just start off with a sprint and then collapse for the rest of the, for the uh, delivery. It's, we're talking long-term projects up to three or four months as well. People have to learn how to pace themselves when they're creating art. So sure, there are times where you have to go without sleep because you're the pivotal artist on that job the artist that the only person in the team knows what to do on this art production. That means you're pivotal in that role and so you have to make sure that you can sprint every now and then to catch up to the rest of the team. You don't want to be the artist who's holding back everyone else because you haven't completed a piece. So <coughs> scheduling yourself out really helps if you've got some contribution to give to the, the lead artist just before the project starts and your schedule. If you feel that your schedule's not fair, or you're scheduling someone else's time, get together and communicate about what you think needs to be doing and then see if you can get it done in that time. Dailies, show people what you're doing every day. Pace yourself, as just discussed. Gold coins and boiler room. Well, I better be careful on time because these are really endless. Gold coins for trolls. What are they? The gold coins really represent rewards that you give your team all the time. Now, everybody has a bit of troll in them and everybody tries to make sure that the troll stays embedded and hidden from the rest of the world. But everybody needs to know they're getting rewarded for what they're doing. And if you have someone on your team that doesn't really feel like he's getting into the work and he's just there for the money, you'll see that pretty quickly. And those are the sorts of people you don't want to work with because their passion doesn't come from what they're doing. Whereas the other artists who really love it but are still paying the bills and have a family and they have to be realistic, you can't have them there working for free, you have to throw them gold coins, extra things, and that includes wages, of course. But it includes things like a pub lunch on a Friday or every now and then take them go-karting <laughs> or paintballing or... I mean, we're, as computer geeks, we really, really need to feel like there's someone who is helping us do what we love doing. And that, that is the studios you work for or the, the people that you try to work with during the time um, as an artist. So if you can throw in some of those extra little rewards, people want to work on your team and they enjoy it. They feel a little bit more respected. So gold coins is a great way to placate the trolls, I suppose. And the other one is a boiler room. Well, boiler room mentality is um, when you get a bunch of people who are very enthusiastic about what they do and you put them in the same room and give them a deadline and a schedule and some ideas and a, um, pretty much creative control over a project, you'll get a boiler mentality of everybody's energy and lots of information sharing and suggestions and everything seems to reinforce itself really once you get that boiling happening on, 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 on a project. Now that boiling could come in in the first few weeks with storyboarding, lots of, lots of ideas and throwing this idea down for the script or it could come later with the solving of why the hell this rig's flipping out after this move or all sorts of scenarios on a production environment have a benefit from boiler room and you only really get a boiler room mentality when you're able to communicate to people quickly. And that's usually inside a studio. If you can set up a Skype meeting and with this guy in one country and this guy with the other, it sort of doesn't give it that energy. But so in studio, if you can make up a boiler room mentality about solving a problem and everyone's positive, you're going to get some incredible results and, and keep those trolls away. People's, people's internal trolls just disappear and you never see that troll again. 
All right, so then um, the other trials that are, are clients. Now, thousands upon thousands of websites online have horror stories about clients. <coughs> We can only all add to them if we keep working. And you know, every new client is a little of a new horror story, but the clients that are trolls, you know, there's the fussy ones, the ones that won't let a project go. They won't, they won't let that pixel stay there. They want to move it to, to the left and, oh no, maybe move it back a little bit more. You know, those sorts of people. Then there's the shifty guys that just don't quite know where that money went. You know, the check was in the mail. I'm sure I paid that last week. Um, those guys that, you, oh, you, I, I didn't answer my phone, sorry mate, I was overseas, you know, those kind of uh, trolls, very, very difficult to avoid. And then there's just the greedy ones, you know, the guys that always want to screw you on price, you've agreed on a budget, oh mate, I'm having a bit of trouble, can you help me out? Or those people that don't understand that true talent, like artists that know what they're doing on the time frame. You can hire a guy, very expensive sometimes, to get a guy in to do a, a, a character and it with hair and posed and rigged and modelled into a sculpted into pose as a poster. It's expensive to get someone who knows how to do that and they don't get that, oh no, you don't just click a button or, and they're just constantly trying to cheapen your work and those greedy clients that, that on, ongoing pressure to make it cheaper or faster or, but aside from the fact that you're putting your artistic integrity behind what you're delivering. So as soon as you deliver to that client, it's gone and your name's all over it. Unless, of course, you can somehow hide it or give it a new portfolio area, drafts or something like that. So the money. Um, to me, this is a business and, and it's, I, I'm enjoying it incredibly, but the money is, is the main pivot on which we survive doing this. And, so if you've got a client that's trying to withhold money, there is a big problem because sometimes you get caught with your cash flow. You, if, if, if you can't pay people around you, they're not going to want to work with you um, uh, unless, of course, they're able to and then um, if they've got some income to, as reserve to work, uh, to pay their bills or their mortgages, then that's fair. They can come along and help and we've had scenarios where that's happened. But most of the time people want to earn their money and love what they do, so you have to pay them. Um, you just have to, you just have to, with these trials, you just have to identify them early and lock people down with contracts and get payments in advance and deposits and milestone payments and all of the hundreds of things that you have to learn when you're running a studio. Um, they're very difficult to avoid and I highly recommend people who are interested in working in a studio, developing a studio or, or a small place to go to work rather than working from home. Um, really try to nail down contractual arrangements with any clients that you take on, particularly new clients. I'm sure old clients, you know, maybe they do genuinely have some credit issues, but if you can't identify new people, just make sure you've got contracts so there's lots and lots of paperwork backing you up if it ever gets nasty. Things. What kinds of trolls do there exist in things? Well, software and hardware. Hardware, just buy good stuff. I mean, I'm not, uh, I've built my own computers for the last 12 years. I know how to build a computer. Most of the guys in, in, in the office do as well. So we just buy good components and rarely have we had a machine go down uh, for hardware reasons. So just keep in mind it can happen and we've had cables come loose at the worst possible time. So just make sure if you don't take care of that trial, he'll come and steal some of your coins later when rendering's due and the whole system goes down. Software. We use all types of software. Um, I can't honestly say we're an open source production studio. I, I, we do use 3ds Max uh, in our 3D pipeline, but um, Blender has been a major part of our pipeline for a long time and so they work quite well in parallel. We can get point cache out of Blender into Max and vice versa so we can cross our pipelines at the ca animated character stage. Licensing, well, remote artists, it doesn't matter to a studio if you've got your own licenses or you're using the infinite evaluation copy, but when you're a studio, you can't be caught using unlicensed software because it's not going to bode well upon the help that people give you or even the reputation you're trying to maintain if that's, if that's important. So we do subscribe to every software, it is expensive and, and um, we just don't want to get caught in a time of ramp up where um, uh, you have to take on more people and you, you get caught out because you don't have enough licences. 
So that's a trial. Um, I do tend to get most of the 3D done that I need to get done in Blender, and most of it meaning 90% of the time. So um, it's remarkable that I can use a tool that I don't have to license, and I can work with artists on the site and not even have to license them uh, for, for, for free, and uh, particularly with, uh, particularly with the, the backing of the uh, Blender's, Blender's infinite development um, uh, ability. People are infinitely wanting to improve the software. It's, it's incredible. Um, bugs, well, yep, these bugs, trolls, and they're going to come along and bite you if you're not careful as well. Um, production, so we've had to get in touch with the devs, and uh, doing that with uh, Autodesk is <laughs> literally like yelling into the Grand, Grand Canyon, but doing that with Blender, I'd get a response in 24 hours, and if it can't be fixed, it'll certainly be submitted to the person that can fix it by the next bug release. And if I'm looking on graphical.org and getting the latest build, usually within a day or two, it's fixed, and that's incredible to me as, as someone who uses uses uh, uh, software of all sorts. It's uh, so much faster to get something done. Uh, so there's your bugs and the updates, yeah, well, sorry, where does that go? The, I've only got a short amount of time, but I did want to discuss this. The, the, the Blender change from 2.4 to 2.5, the new interface, ha actually had a fair ramification on some of our projects. We've been working on Kajimba for five years prior. Um, a lot of the models and a lot of those things have been done. <laughs> Um, in ben Blender 2.49. In fact, all of the test animations we've done were 2.49. It pretty much means we've locked that pipeline down to 2.49 without a significant rework. So the change to 2.5 was disruptive to that project, but it also meant that the software was easier to teach. I can actually sit a group of guys down in a room and teach them how to use the software within a day. For an example, we had an animator who was working on a, um, a feature films in and around Sydney, he'd never touched Blender. Within three days, he was doing finished shots for Kajimba um, without having touched the software before. So a very impressive way to, to uh, have a tool set that can be taught so quickly and get into production straight away. So pluses and minuses of changing between 2.49 to 5, well, I think it's a much better software now. It's a lot easier to make sure people it's familiar. Um, so I don't regret that, although it will be expensive for us to get the um, Kajimba character rigs and the links and the linked libraries. We used a lot of linked libraries on that project. So, um, And anyway, 2.49 still is by far the most stable edition of um, Blender. I mean, I'm probably going to get beaten up outside for saying that, but 2.49 will run in an internet cafe in Bali or uh, at the top of a mountainside on a little triple E PC. Um, they're sort of starting to become a reality with 2.49. Um, the ones that are up now, 6.4, 6, 6.5, but um, uh, it is tried and true, it's been tested infinitely and we know that that can happen, so if work needs to get done, um, we can avoid any of the trolls by just using software that we know. Um, that's it about trolls. I think um, the main message is just don't be a troll. Don't don't try to find or befriend trolls. If 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 trolls are your friend, they'll still poison people around you. So just try to ignore them. If you'll know you're a troll because they won't have your back. You know that kind of thing. If you work somewhere as a uh, an artist and you know everyone smiles and thanks you and says goodbye and never invites you back, well you must have done something to troll their workflow or they ran out of work. Um, we had a troll that came along. We had a client that was giving us an awful lot of work for four or five years and we put him as a lead artist, um, unknowingly put him as a lead artist in charge of a client and we ended up at the end of that project not getting paid and losing that client because the artist was rude and aggressive. He was a troll but he was a good artist. He did have a portfolio and he had a reputable reputation in other um, filmmaking realms but not in the project we had him on. So it was it was uh, very uh, difficult for a small company to lose a client of that size based upon a troll. So just be careful about those people that you um, that you don't in, that you get a bad vibe about by they're not contributing to the pipeline. They're not sitting within the artist and apprentice um, uh, scheme of authority. I suppose we could call it. 
And the best thing to do is just walk around the troll. If you can't find a, if you can't find an alternative bridge, then build your own bridge across the river. Don't cross the bridge where there's a troll. Okay, thank you. Is there any any questions? Now, if there if there are any questions, I will have to ask someone to hand around a mic because I can't hear you across a room like this. So if there are, or just come and see me after this. How do you find the Blender manual? Is it useful to you? The Blender manual? The, <laughs> the wiki or the, 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 the manual is, the manual is everything that you can find online, um, not just the one official one. That's the thing about Blender is so many people have done contributions to the tutorials or uh, wiki pages or anything really. It's, it's, it, you just have to search through the forums. That's, that's first step for us. The manuals, the book, the paperwork goes out of date so fast. I mean, there's something new coming out in every edition. And if, if you download the latest builds, usually th there's an explanation on what, what the builds included and a little link to a, wow, a whole tutorial. So I can learn about um, all the tools without really needing anything printed on paper. But yeah, the wiki, the wiki's very, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to think we could help contribute more to that because we do find in our production of art unique ways of, of using something that maybe we didn't know was supposed to be used that way, but it just worked, those things. What are, what are we doing next year? The, 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 over the next 12 months, we've got an interesting look into augmented reality. Um, we've got a whole bunch of characters which we're interested in putting um, into virtual spaces using cameras. Um, do anyone understand what augmented reality is <coughs> or hands up who doesn't? Okay, so our characters, we, we make mascots, that's pretty much primary what we do, uh, design and, and make characters. So these, the market's now demanding more interactive versions of these characters. Uh, uh, standing on your kiosk, waving to your customers, or responding to your shop front store when you carry, when you when you uh, you walk past on the footpath, the character's in the window and responds to you walking past. Those sorts of projects. Um, I have a uh, an, an augmented monkey jumping around as a first test, but it's it's um uh, it's still in its early days. I see over the next twelve months a lot more work for us in that area because a lot of our customers are just asking what, what more can you do with these tools and so we're, we're showing different techniques so it's it's not so much more pre-rendered it's mostly real-time 3D now so uh, extremely exciting. Uh, I'd like to thank you for, for because it's been very sincere, this uh, presentation, and that's not uh, usually uh, to be found. But I, I, I'd like to ask you something. Have you ever been a troll yourself? Of course, of course, everyone's a troll. When, when I was first working, we were working on a project that was a three-year project. It was my first job as an animator. It was three years long. The money was coming from no one knew where, and so there was 45 people in the same room working day after day after day, day making real-time um, <laughs> flash banners. They weren't, they weren't embedded into a web page's flash, but they were actually, funnily enough, embedded into a software called B3D, which was brilliant digital entertainments pitch into the world of 3D. Um, uh, basically putting a 3D player into a website. So that's, that was in 99, 97, 98, 99, around there. And hundreds of, uh, 45 artists like myself, not with really no direction, were told to put together these episodes. And I worked on Superman and Xena the Princess Warrior and Popeye and those sorts of candy projects, which was kind of fun. But I, so much money was funneled into that project that 
the, it f effectively collapsed because they weren't hiring the right people. We were all too young and inexperienced. They didn't have anyone managing it. There wasn't any art direction. And so we all contributed to its failure because the project, the product was really, really clever for its time. It was playing back quake level graphics in your browser if you downloaded the plugin. But um, we all were very young and taking it easy and treating the job as a nine to five and there wasn't any passion. The, bo the boiler room mentality didn't work at all. So it, it, it collapsed and so you can't expect a team of people to continually be fun to just have fun. They have to be practical and pragmatic. Why are they there? They're there either as an artist or as an artist apprentice to make sure that the art gets done, really. Thank you. So everyone's a troll unknowingly, um, but the people that are trolls and they know they're trolls, well, just steer clear of those people. Okay, uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you, you were talking about uh, clients and I just wanted to know if when you're talking about the clients, is this usually the company or is there a second level, like a, a marketing agency which plays the role, the client for, for you or makes it any either. difference for you to work with can such agencies? That. Agencies. Can someone relay that? Sorry, I can't hear from up Okay, sorry. I uh, just wanted to ask if you were talking about the client, if this is a company usually or a different layer like an, a marketing agency or, or, or things like that or if that makes a difference for you working between these uh, kind of clients. Yeah, uh, all the different types of clients you mean, yeah. Absolutely it does. If you're, if you're working with the head of a company, um, they can do, it once they've signed the deal with you, if you're to produce a series of posters and they're the owner of the company or the owner of that brand, um, uh, that, uh, that means that you're going to be dealing with a possible terrible troll, like the, the worst of all trolls because they're going to constantly push you and push you. But if you're dealing with their marketing and sales guy instead or someone lower down the tree, not the owner, that opens up a whole new realm of troll, which is the person who wants to get involved and doesn't need to be involved troll. The person who wants to be part of the production, but you really don't need them there at all and they're just getting in the way. So sometimes you've got to pick one troll over the other. You've got to make sure, is the owner going to give me fair course and I'll be able to deliver art or is the little minion that he's chosen to be my antagonistic little gremlin, is he going to come in and cause too much trouble? Well, you've just got to pick which one you go with and, and grin and, and um, clench your teeth, really. All right, look, I'm out of time. I have, thank you for having me, everybody. Um, and it's been a pleasure. I look forward to meeting all of you.